Jade? Here, this chair is for you. Welcome back. In this week's video, we're going to be continuing our transfusion medicine theme, and we're going to be talking about blood products. The decision to perform a blood product transfusion is going to depend upon what the condition that you're treating is, or clinically why your patient is sick. So I'd like to talk in this video about the different types of blood products that are available to us, how they're stored, and how they're administered. The most common type of transfusion that we think about when we think about blood transfusion is our classic red blood cell transfusion. Red blood cells are administered to patients who are anemic and not just anemic, but who are clinical for their anemia, meaning they have altered perfusion parameters that show that their body needs more red blood cells, more oxygen carrying capacity. You're going to see different references which quote different PCVs, packed cell volumes for administration of a red blood cell transfusion, but really in clinical practice, it's just going to depend on your patient. For patients who have chronic anemia, so from conditions like IMHA or chronic kidney disease, they're going to tolerate lower PCVs than our patients with acute loss because their body has become accustomed to working with lower levels of red blood cells, lower oxygen carrying capacity. Whereas our patients that have undergone trauma or are hemorrhaging for some other reason, like a ruptured splenic mass, their body has not gradually become accustomed to having a lower PCV. So they're going to be clinical for their anemia much sooner than our patients that have this chronic anemia. So while one patient may be tolerating a PCV of 12%, another may be clinical for their anemia and require a blood transfusion closer to 20. So looking for a specific PCV number where you should be giving a transfusion isn't really the number that you should be looking at. You should be looking at your patient as a whole and are they clinical for their anemia. So a clinical indication for a red blood cell transfusion is going to be tachycardia, tachypnea, increased respiratory effort, pale mucous membranes with a prolonged CRT, and potentially poor pulses. Red blood cell transfusions can be administered in two basic forms, packed red blood cells, which are abbreviated to PRBC, and whole blood. Packed red cells are what we typically see in clinical practice. They're usually what we're purchasing from blood donation companies. They're collected from donors that have gone through a screening process, and then the whole blood that has been collected is centrifuged so that the most of the plasma is removed and all that's remaining are the packed cells and their anticoagulant, which also typically has some additives in it to try to preserve the cells to improve their stored longevity. Most of the time, transfusions are anticoagulated with a CPD solution, which stands for citrate phosphate dextrose solution. So it's an anticoagulant that is also providing our red blood cells with nutrients to help them increase their shelf life. Packed cell units need to be refrigerated, typically between one and six degrees Celsius. And different references will all will, uh, disagree with how they should be stored. The traditional train of thought is that they should be stored in a vertical upright position, although there have been some studies that say that maybe if they're stored horizontally but not flat, still upright, that may improve some of their acid base parameters a little bit, but basically making sure they're not laying flat is the key. 
They should also preferably be stored in their own refrigerator, their own blood uh, product refrigerator, so that this is opened less so that it can maintain its temperature better. And a lot of these refrigerators also have alarms that will tell you if their refrigeration has failed or they're getting too hot or too cold. Packed red cells are indicated for patients who are clinical for their anemia and who don't necessarily need the plasma part of the blood. For patients who are severely hypovolemic and anemic, they may benefit more from whole blood, although again, this is less readily available to us. So even in these patients, we may still be giving them packed red cells because their units are still 125 to 250 mils of blood, so they are going to get some volume from that. But if you have the access to stored whole blood or even fresh whole blood, there are a lot of patients that can benefit from that as well. Examples of patients who may be clinical for their anemia but not really require any of the plasma part of the blood are again our chronic anemia. So our IMHA patients who aren't necessarily missing volume but are missing red cells and our CKD animals that have anemia of uh, chronic disease and again aren't missing intravascular volume. But if you have access to whole blood through either an in-house donation program or you can buy stored whole blood. There are a variety of patients that may benefit from having some of those plasma factors as well. Fresh whole blood is blood that is collected from a donor and administered usually within four to six hours, but depending on how it's collected and stored, up to 24 hours. And fresh whole blood has plasma still, so it has all of these clotting factors, plasma proteins, it's going to help dramatically with intravascular volume. It's going to help potentially provide platelets to patients that may be having an active bleed. So there are definitely benefits to administration of fresh whole blood if you have access to it. Now this would mean you have to have a donor program set up uh, to be able to have access to fresh whole blood. But you may purchase stored whole blood, which is blood that has been collected from a donor and has not been centrifuged or separated in any way. So it still has all of the plasma proteins, the clotting factors, platelets, and red blood cells. Stored whole blood usually needs to be used within a few weeks depending on how it's collected and what it is anticoagulated with. So if your patient is anemic from acute loss, whole blood may be a good option for them. A second most common blood transfusion we're going to see in veterinary medicine is plasma administration. Plasma is the component of your blood that has clotting factors and protein, and it's very important for helping us maintain our intravascular volume. Plasma is typically stored as fresh frozen plasma, meaning it is centrifuged out of the red blood cells and then frozen within eight hours of collection and for up to one year. After one year, plasma is still good if it's been frozen, but it's not considered fresh frozen any plasma anymore. It's considered like stored frozen plasma and it has a reduced amount of active clotting factors. Administration of plasma is typically to treat coagulopathies where the patient has a clotting problem or in some cases hypoproteinemia, so patients that have low protein, although you typically need a little bit more of an increased volume of plasma to increase protein as opposed to to treat clotting problems. Cryoprecipitated plasma is a plasma concentrate that is prepared by taking your frozen plasma and thawing it partially so that it's a little bit of a slushy and then collecting the supernatant. And it is a concentrated version of our plasma because it has an increased number of fibrinogens, fibronectins, von Willebrand's factor, and clotting factor eight. So cryoprecipitated plasma is actually the <laughs> therapy of choice for patients that have a coagulopathy with any of those primary clotting issues. All right, kind of moving on to some of our less common blood products is platelet administration. Unfortunately, platelets are not very long lived and they're very hard to store and maintain their clinical use. So 
because of that platelet administration in veterinary medicine is not incredibly common although with recent advances it is becoming more available to us in clinical practice platelet rich plasma is available and this is collected from whole blood although it is not able to be stored for very long typically needs to be administered less than 48 hours after collection although there are some resources that say up to five days depending on how it's stored Lyophilized platelets are becoming more available to us, and these are essentially platelets that have been freeze dried and they come in a powdered vial and you add sterile water and you can administer them as a bolus typically for things that are going to increase our risk for bleeding. So for patients that are thrombocytopenic but require life-saving surgery, you can administer them lyophilized platelets and then immediately go to surgery to hopefully help reduce their intraoperative risk of bleeding. Another type of blood product to be aware of is albumin. Albumin is a protein found in our body that is heavily responsible for maintaining oncotic pressure, which means maintaining the pressure that our plasma exerts in our blood, which is pretty responsible for what helps maintain our intravascular water. So as our albumin decreases, oncotic pressure will decrease and water will move from the intravascular space to the interstitial space. And this is often what causes edema in our patients. So if you've ever seen a patient that has critical illness that has been hospitalized for several days, they'll have a loss of albumin, their oncotic pressure will go down and they'll develop edema. Unfortunately, you typically need a large amount of albumin to make a huge clinical difference in our oncotic pressure, so this may be limiting in large dogs. But albumin is available to us in both canine and human form. All right, so there are a couple of other blood products that are not commonly used that I haven't reviewed in this video, but in general, those are the big ones you're going to see in clinical practice. So from here, I'd like to talk about administration of blood products and monitoring a blood product administration. The veterinary nurse plays a huge role in making sure that our blood products are administered correctly. We are often the only person that is dealing with our patients during their transfusion. We usually are the ones going to the blood fridge and selecting the unit, prepping it, administering it, and monitoring the patient during administration. So it is of the utmost importance that we are very familiar with how all of the different blood products are administered and how to monitor blood products during administration. Before starting your administration, it's very important to collect all of your baseline vitals so that you can know what's changing as you administer your transfusion. You should have a full TPR, so a temperature, respiration, respiratory effort, uh, heart rate, pulses, blood pressure if you can, and you should also record your beginning PCV and total protein. Red blood cell units should be visually inspected for anything wrong with them. Typically, if the blood appears brown or if there's evidence of hemolysis, that unit should not be given. And this may seem uh, like something I shouldn't have to say, but check your expiration date, especially if you're in a practice that doesn't use a lot of blood. I have seen expired units be overlooked and administered to patients. Best practice is going to be taking one of the tails that comes on your red blood cell unit and collecting a microhematocrit tube from it and spinning it down so that you can visually inspect the non-red blood cell part of the unit and make sure you don't see any signs of hemolysis. So any red or pink color in the plasma that's remaining in the unit. And of course, always double check the blood type and make sure that you're administering the correct blood type to your patient. If you're administering a frozen unit, this should be thawed per the manufacturer's recommendations. If you work in a practice that has a plasma thawer, those work pretty quickly. Uh, if you don't, you can double bag your unit, either in like Ziploc bags or something that you can seal and soak it in room temperature water. Although this does take a little bit longer, the water should not be too hot because that could damage the cells and the proteins that are in the unit. Both red cells and plasma should be administered through an inline filter. It is of extreme importance for me to mention here that canine red blood cells cannot be administered through heminate filters. If you're not familiar with the heminate filter, it's the square 
blood product filter that you can just attach to the end of an extension set. These filters are about 18 microns in size, and in terms of filter sizes, the larger the number, the larger particles can pass through the filter. Inline blood product filters are usually around 200 microns, so that's a pretty big difference in size. The reason it's extremely important to know that canine cells cannot pass through these square humanate filters is because studies have been done that show that at the 24 hour mark, up to 100% of the transfusion is not able to be identified, meaning the red cells that they have marked are not found and have likely lysed and have provided no clinical value to our patient at that point. Humanate filters are acceptable to use with feline blood because their cells are smaller. So the same studies have been done on feline blood that have been done in canine blood and the feline blood has been shown that the use of a humanate filter does not change the red blood cell longevity after being transfused. So if you are in your practice and you see someone using a humanate filter on canine blood, it is very important to make sure that transfusion gets stopped and an inline filter is utilized. However, if you need to administer a small volume of canine red cells to a patient, you can spike your bag as you would normally using your inline filter set. You connect a three-way stopcock to the end of the set and then just pull your blood into a syringe that way. That way your blood is still being filtered, but it is not being a run through a humanate filter for our canines. On the same note, it's also very important to not administer blood products through peristaltic pumps. And what that means is through pumps that use pressure on the extension line to vary how much volume they're delivering, which are most fluid pumps. You can administer blood products through a plumb set because it is, it is not a volumetric peristaltic pump. But our usual Practivet HESCA pumps are peristaltic pumps, so we cannot use those to administer blood products. Uh, the same studies that looked at the use of humanate filters on canine blood found that up to 50% of blood transfusions administered through peristaltic pumps are unavailable at the 24 hour mark. So I've already made a video about how to calculate fluid rates for administration of blood products if you are using a gravity drip rate. And you can check that out, I've linked it above. So once you've got your blood product primed and ready to administer, you can begin your transfusion. Usually blood products are administered over two to four hours, uh, sometimes faster in our extremely critical patients. But if you are not slamming your red blood cells as fast as they can go, for example, if your patient's bleeding out on the table and you are actually administering your blood products over a calculated two to four hour rate, it's very important to administer the product slower in the beginning so that you can take time to monitor for a transfusion reaction. So when we initially begin our transfusion, we should be checking our vitals every 15 minutes for the first hour and then every 30 minutes until the transfusion is done. Uh, throughout all of those checks, we should be checking temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate and effort, mucous membrane color, and CRT. We should also be monitoring our patients for development of any vomiting or diarrhea. These can all be signs of a transfusion reaction, in which case, if you're worried about a reaction, you should stop the transfusion and have your clinician come and look at your patient. At that time, your clinician will weigh the pros and cons of the transfusion and they'll decide whether they're gonna go forward with the transfusion or stop it. There are mild reactions in which you can administer diphenhydramine and a corticosteroid and continue the transfusion at a slow rate but uh, serious transfusion reaction signs uh, will often require that you completely stop the transfusion and either try again with a different unit um, or just consider whether that patient uh, can continue to get blood products. All right, and with that, we are gonna be talking in our next video about transfusion reactions and the different types of reactions that can occur. So if you've made it this far, as always, please like this video, subscribe to my channel. And if you have any 
particular topics that you'd like for me to cover, please leave a comment in the, uh, in the comment section and I'll do my best to cover that material. So uh, as always, thanks for watching guys and I will see you next time. Oh, you're so cute. Oh, he's a good girl.